Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Certainly like to welcome each of you here. I know we have several visitors that are with us and we're excited to know that you have joined us for this long Labor Day weekend. And, and we're hoping that all of you enjoy not only today, but uh, tomorrow as many of us will have the day off. And, and hopefully we can spend that time with our families or with some friends and, and to relax and, and to uh, enjoy this idea of rest. <laughs> As most of you know, I recently, in my blog, sent out a survey, and, and in that survey, I had asked the question, how do people change knowing that it is in their best interest? In other words, how do they work through fear, resistance, apathy, rationalization, ambivalence, laziness, etc., Etc. And I certainly appreciate all of the responses that I've gotten so far, and I, I'm planning to use them in, in a larger research project. But this morning, I'd like to share with you from God's Word where I'm at so far as I'm asking that question. How do people change knowing that it is in their best interest? Recently, a, a group by the name of Montgomery Gentry and also a fellow by the name of Kenny Chesney sung a song entitled, Some People Change. It, it's about a song about an old man who at one point in his life was filled with hatred. He was filled with racism and, and that fellow changed. It's also a story about a woman who had battled alcohol and, and substance issues her entire life and and she was able to change. And in the chorus of this song, it, it says, here's to the strong, thanks to the brave. Don't give up hope, some people change. Against all odds, against the grain, love finds a way, some people change. Thank God for those who make it, let them be the light. Some people change. And although some people believe that, that some can change, others believe that no one can change. A, a, a fellow or a group by the name of Macklemore has recently sung a song entitled Same Love. And it's a story about a fellow who is struggling with same-sex attraction issues and and uh, in, a, in a seemingly bitter and frustrating way in the song, they, they sing, the right-wing conservatives think that it's a, a decision and you can be cured with some treatment and religion. Man-made rewiring of a predisposition, playing God. Ah, oh, nah, here we go. America the brave still fears what we don't know. And God loves all his children is somehow forgotten. But we paraphrase a book written 3,500 years ago. I don't know. And I can't change. Even if I tried. Even if I wanted to. I can't change. Even if I tried. Even if I wanted to. We're, we're talking this morning about change. And we are asking the question, is it for some, or is it for none, or is it for all? And despite the idea that, that some say that only some people can change, and despite the fact that others say that it's impossible to change, we're wanting to see this morning in Scripture what the Bible says about how everyone will be Changed. In fact, our lesson this morning is entitled, We Will All Be Changed. Now, we're working our way to 1 Corinthians 15, but we've got a few stops along the way. And for the moment, as we consider these three upfront texts, we're, our, our key word is the word transform. And the word transform comes from the, the Greek word metamorpho. you familiar with the idea of metamorphosis. And it, it means transformed or it means changed after being with. And that's our key word, transformed. And by definition, 
It, it means changed after being with. And so this morning, first of all, as we're considering 2 Corinthians 3, in order to change, we need to, number one, be recommended by Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You know that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ our God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves. But our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So tomorrow is Labor Day, and we're all enjoying our day off, hopefully. I realize some may have to work, and hopefully it won't be too difficult of a day. And, and many of you are in a role in which you supervise, or, or which you manage, or even employ other people. And, and so I, I know what I, I know that many of you know what it's like to have to let someone go, to just uh, help them move on to, to bigger and better. And, and, and your reasoning behind that uh, may have been the fact that this particular person that you need to let go has, for whatever reason, not not worked hard in the last few weeks, or maybe not done anything at all in the last few months, or even the last year. Or so, and so you let them go, and at first, of course, they get mad, and then they want to know why. And then, about two or three weeks, two or three weeks later, once they've got a new job that they want to get, they call you and ask you for a letter of recommendation, and you're wondering how, in good conscience, can you write a good letter of recommendation, knowing that they didn't work hard, knowing that they didn't do anything. And knowing that is the reason why you let them go. But you see, when it comes to salvation, we are all like that employee. We're all like that, that person, because in our own lives, before we became Christians, we sat around and, and we didn't do anything or didn't do much for the Lord. We didn't work at all for him. There was no laboring for the Lord. That we, we weren't doing anything. In fact, we were working against the Lord. We've wasted a lot of time. But we've sinned. But here's the thing. Because of God's mercy and grace. And when we became Christians. And as, as, as soon as we desire to become Christians. We have Jesus's recommendation. You see, it doesn't matter what we've done in our past. When we are ready to change our lives and to start living for Christ, no matter how much time we've wasted, no matter how many sins we've committed, no matter how long it's been since we've done absolutely nothing, when we come to Jesus and at that moment when we become Christians, we have the recommendation of Jesus. And notice verse number 12 of 2 Corinthians 3 and following. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would, be, would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it, while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, 
the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. And we, notice verse 18, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In this particular translation, I, my, the word that I, that I see in verse 18 is reflecting. Your, your translation may, see, may say contemplating the Lord's glory. In other translations, it may say beholding the Lord's glory. This is a, a, a present tense verb. And as we're looking at the text, we also see that being transformed is also in the present tense. And so as we try to make sense of this, as we are contemplating or reflecting or beholding the Lord's glory, we at the same time are being transformed into the image of Christ. You see, in, in other words, as we're contemplating Christ, we at the same time are changing to become more like Him as well. The opposite is also the case. When we stop contemplating Christ, when we stop reflecting Him, when we stop beholding Him, we will stop changing. Many people who say they can't change are listening to everyone and everything besides what God says in His Word. They say, it's just who I am. I can't help it. I was born that way. However, God would not allow us to be born a certain way that would completely prevent us from being transformed into the image of his son. It may not be easy, but it is possible. We have hope. And as verse 12 of our text says, we will need to be bold. We will need to be courageous. And as we behold and as we contemplate the image of Jesus, knowing that he has recommended us, we can and we will start changing. Secondly, this morning, as we're moving over to Romans chapter 12, we realize that in order to change, we need to, yes, be recommended by Christ. And number two, we need to renew our minds as well. Romans 12, verse number one, the Bible says this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we think about changing, we're going to have to deal with our thoughts. We're going to have to deal with our emotions. And we're going to have to deal with our behaviors. Sometimes when, I, when I'm working with people, and I know you've also heard others say the same thing. That they, they'll say, well, I, I can't help it. I cannot change. That's the way that I feel. And I cannot change my feelings. Sometimes it's a husband who says that he's no longer in love with their wife. Or, or maybe a, an adult child that uh, cannot get past some of the past hurt in their lives. But what we need to understand it is that scripture is, is very uh, repetitive on the following point, And that is, we have control over our thoughts. 
And every feeling is preceded by a thought. And so it goes that if we can change the way that we think, we can change the way that we feel. You see, so many times we focus on changing our feelings that we forget that we can, number one, make a decision to renew our minds, to change the way that we think. And so when that spouse makes the decision to fall back in love with their, their, their spouse, then it will happen eventually. When, when that adult child makes the decision that I am going to move on and I am going to let go of hurtful things from the past, then eventually that will start occurring and forgiveness will be right around the corner. And of course, paying attention to verse number one, as we are being transformed by renewing our minds, we're doing this all within view of God's mercy. His mercy, His grace is enabling us to renew our minds and to truly change and be transformed. Third and finally, as we go over to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We, we realize that in order to change, we need to be recommended by Christ. And everyone who desires to be a Christian has the recommendation of Jesus we also, number two, need to renew our minds. And number three, we need to rejoice about heaven. Notice what Philippians 3 verse number one says. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Also picking up in verse number 12 of Philippians 3. Not that I have already obtained it. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining or pressing on or reaching for or towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And verse number 20 of Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. When we think about changing, we not only have to take into account our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but we also need to understand the past, the present, and the future. And what we need to come to understand and come to grips with is that there is absolutely nothing we can do to change the past. It, that's beyond our control. No matter how much we hurt from the past, no matter how much regret we have from the past, no matter how much pain or difficulty is as a result of the past, there is nothing that we can do to change the past. However, the Apostle Paul says in verse 13 of Philippians 3 that he is forgetting what lies behind. It's not that he's forgotten and that he can't even bring it to memory. In fact, in the first 10 verses of Philippians 3, he just recounted his past. But what he says is that he's forgetting it in the sense that he's no longer allowing it to control his present and to dictate his future. He, he's forgetting it. He's, he's moving on. He's letting go. And he is now pressing on and reaching towards the prize that is in Christ Jesus. And what's also magnificent about this text in Philippians 3 is that we see that change, at least in this life, 
It is not just a one-time event, but it is an ongoing process. It's not something that he says, forgetting what is lying behind. And he didn't say, I forgot what lies behind. He's forgetting. And that's an ongoing action. And he is pressing on and he is reaching towards. That is an ongoing action. Change is a process. And here's the thing. If we are rejoicing along the way about our future home in heaven then we're never going to give up. And we're always going to keep plugging away, knowing that no matter how difficult this change and this transformation is, we are going to keep going after it. As we close this morning, I invite you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we try to bring this in for a landing, and as we try to wrap all of these things together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, pick up in verse number 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. We will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we will be changed. For the imperishable must close itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been closed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, and the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. About a day or so ago, uh, my grandma was trying to get a hold of me. And, and I was uh, talking with some folks and I had my phone in my pocket and it was vibrating. And I could tell by the I could just tell that, um, I, I don't know how, but I knew that I had got a Facebook post. And then about two minutes later, I, I knew I got another Facebook post. And, and then the way that the, the phone was vibrating, I knew someone was trying to call me. And, and then it, it stopped and then it started again. And I'm thinking, all right, Grandma, I'm going to call you. No, no one is that persistent except my 81-year-old grandma. And, and so she was calling me to find out if I got her Facebook post and to let me know that she has read my blog. And that she has replied via Facebook about what she thought about change. And she says, in change in my life down through the years, it hasn't been an easy path. Every day you try to better yourself by fearing God and keeping his commandments. And as the years go by, you do change for the better because you want to go to heaven when you die. That's the best reason I know for changing your life every day. Change. Is it some? Is it none? Or is it all? Well, eventually, at some point when we die, we will all be changed. But let's not wait until we die to be changed. Rather, let's start today. This morning we are singing this song of invitation and it's the perfect time to, to begin that change process. You have the recommendation of Jesus not only when you decide to become a Christian, but you have it now. Jesus is recommending for you to be a Christian. 
And the reason that we know that is because He has died on the cross for us. And He is resurrected for us. And He wants you to be in heaven when you die. And so if you will believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you will change the way that you live and, and repent of those past sins and, and tell others that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and the Bible talks about baptism, being immersed into water for the forgiveness of all of your past sins. Will you become a Christian this morning? Will you be restored as a Christian? Let's start changing today so that we can go to heaven when we die. It is in our eternal best interest. If you need to come, will you do so while together we stand and sing?